Okay. Okay, so this is um, just uh, to give us a bit of a, a step back and look at where Antarctica is, surrounded by uh, the treacherous Southern Ocean. This has meant that it's been really um, obviously very difficult to get to. And 100 years ago, when AGU was, was being formed, we were sort of right at the end of the, the heroic age of, um, of exploration here. Um, but the story actually starts um, in Hobart. And I decided to go a little bit further back than 100 years. And this is actually back to 1840. Um, and those of you who are familiar with Hobart will know the Kelly Steps. Um, so this is around about the time when the Kelly Steps were being built in Hobart. And this is a picture of Hobart Town at that time. Um, and this was um, the first time that I could find by doing quite a bit of uh, research um, before re preparing this talk. And actually, I have to thank my brother for finding this. Um, this was the first mention of Antarctica in uh, the media. Um, so the, you'll see a, a recurring theme throughout this talk, which is basically about how we report what we know about Antarctica to the media. So I decided to start with this one. So this was the Hobart Gazette in 1840. And the thing that I thought was absolutely uh, fantastic, if you read the first three lines of this, an interesting rather than important geographical discovery has this year been made in the Southern Antarctic Ocean. Talk about understated. Um, so 180 years ago, I guess we didn't really know how important um, Antarctica was going to be um, for us. And this here is a, um, a drawing or a, um, a painting from the 19th century. Um, this is the US uh, ship, the Vinsan, um, which was um, captained by uh, Charles Wilkes. Um, and this is in Disappointment Bay um, in uh, East Antarctica. Okay, so this talk was set up a bit uh, like a timeline, uh, 100 years, I, I split it up into um, four, lots of 25 years. Um, and these kind of fit in with um, my own story as well. So part of this becomes personal and I talk a little bit about uh, me and how I fit into all of this, sort of in the spirit of, um, of the Nye Lecture. So we'll start at the beginning here, uh, 100 years ago, well, it's 101 years ago now, but um, you can, uh, and this is a, a picture that most of you will probably uh, recognize. This is the, uh, the Shackleton expedition. Um, and so this was actually not in 1919. It was a little bit before that. Um, but I uh, found here that um, 1919 was when Ernest Shackleton came back and presented um, the results of this expedition and what they found at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Um, so I thought that was a nice way to tie this back to exactly 100 years ago. Um, so this is how people came back in those times to report their findings. Um, they had, an ex they had a, um, a, a lecture in the Royal Albert Hall, which how nice is that? Uh, we, I wish we could all be there uh, today, maybe, maybe sometime soon. And then um, this was sort of coming in at the tail end of what is known as the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Um, and this is a bit of a timeline here of the, the different um, expeditions that took place um, over this time period. And uh, I know there are many different nationalities on this call, and I hope I haven't left anybody off. Um, but there were multiple different nations that were all um, going down to Antarctica and sort of laying claim on different parts of Antarctica and putting flags up and things. Um, some of it was uh, international collaboration, some of it wasn't. There was a bit of sort of uh, back and forth of uh, this is mine, this is yours kind of thing. Um, but you know, overall there was a lot of sort of quite thrilling um, stories to be told coming back from people who had uh, gone down there and uh, gone across that treacherous Southern Ocean to explore the continent. Um, so this is another, um, excerpt from, this is now the Hobart Mercury, which exists today um, in 1918. This is a reflection, you don't have to read this, obviously it's not that easy to read, but you can, I can actually provide links to all of this uh, stuff that I found, but this was quite interesting article that talked about, like, has it been worth it? They've been going down and doing all this stuff, but what have they actually discovered? Is it really going to be anything that changes our world? So that was uh, just over 100 years ago. Um, and then I just wanted to um, point out or give a shout out to, um, to, to a different, slightly different type of explorer. Um, many of the, um, the expeditions that have taken place have been sort of um, trying to you know, dis dis 
go to the continent and lay claim there. But there was also a little bit of science um, involved, mainly um, to do with looking for the magnetic South Pole. Um, but I wanted to call out Douglas Mawson. He was a, a, a British-born Australian um, explorer who was also a geologist. And he saw um, the merit in going down and mapping the continent and getting some information of a different type. Um, different samples have been collected before, but not really um, any sort of mapping per se. So Mawson um, went down on this expedition. This is in, um, in the, the first period, the first Austral Australasian uh, period in uh, 1911, and he'd been part of that. And this is a um, photograph here that was that was taken um, uh, uh, looking from a sea cave in the front of the Mertz Glacier Tongue um, of the um, sailing yacht Aurora that they used for that expedition. Um, beautiful photograph. Um, I can send the links to all of this where I found it. It's a very, very nice um, piece of history. Um, and then over the next um, couple of decades, uh, Mawson spent some time um, lobbying the British and Australian uh, government and did some fundraising, some private fundraising. And he managed to launch um, and head uh, Banzari, which was the British, um, Australian, um, and New Zealand Antarctic expedition. Um, which was in 1929, uh, um, and they went down using actually the same ship that um, the uh, the Discovery. Um, and here, hopefully, this is going to work. Um, I I need to give a shout out here to Jamin Greenbaum, who um, told me about the seaplanes that they used during this period, which I hadn't realised. Um, and this was to map um, the coast, and so. A lot of this became the mapping, which then led to the establishment of the um, Australian Antarctic Territory, um, in which the location, uh, the bases of Mawson and Davis are located. Uh, okay. This was definitely a, okay. I hope you can hear that. So this was them taking off um, after launching the seaplane over the side of the ship. It's all a bit uh, treacherous, especially seeing them bringing it back. Um, really great piece of footage. Um, and this led to some mapping, um, which basically meant that they could start looking at the shape of Antarctica and getting an idea of the overall picture. So in 1932, um, and other um, nations had been doing this as well, the Norwegians, um, and uh, we, we basically um, from mapping different sectors of the continent were able to get a picture of what the continent looked like. So it had gone from being just this mysterious landmass in the Southern Ocean at the bottom of the earth that nobody cared about to actually it's got a shape and wow we actually now have an idea of what it might look like. Um, so this is a National Geographic map uh, dating back to 1932. So you can see you can more or less see um, most of what Antarctica looks like. There's definitely some detail lacking here looking um, over in West Antarctica, um, especially the area that we are also focused on right now, was really not mapped well at all. Um, it's kind of invisible, really. Um, so yeah, it, we're building up a picture, but we haven't quite got there. Okay, so um, bringing you now um, a little bit more into uh, along the timeline, starting um, coming into um, during the Second World War. This is actually. Um, a picture from, um, hang on. okay, this is actually a picture that I got from the British Antarctic Survey. Um, uh, some kind of, I don't even know where I got it from now. This was a long time ago when I put all this together. Um, but this is a secret um, expedition that took place um, towards the end of uh, the Second World War called Operation Tabaran. Um, and this was actually named after a, uh, a nightclub in Paris. Um, because the men that were going down there were going to be wintering um, and the Antarctic winter is pretty miserable. So I guess this was a, uh, a way to kind of get them through. Uh, um, so Operation Tabaran, uh, this was on the Antarctic Peninsula un unloading um, cargo. Um, and then the next sort of uh, sort of big step change in what we know about the continent happened um, sort of towards the end or just after the end of the Second World War. Um, and this was uh, Operation High Jump. This is a US Navy task force. Um, it had uh, 4,700 men, 13 ships and 33 aircraft. 
that was sent down uh, to Antarctica and they, uh, this was led by Admiral Richard Byrd. And this led to the establishment of many um, bases um, studying uh, over in West Antarctica mainly, um, including, um, including uh, McMurdo and other um, bases over um, in West Antarctica. Um, Okay, um, and this was reported on um, in the paper as well, um, but not quite as, uh, definitely not as uh, very, uh, definitely an understated reporting once again, uh, mapping Antarctica and Little America. Uh, seaplanes from the US Navy's expedition have filled the thousands of square miles of previously blank Antarctic maps. They've discovered five previously unknown islands and two mountain ranges, but it kind of looks like a little classified, kind of shoved away on page 17 of of uh, the Hobart uh, paper. Um, definitely not, um, not the sort of press that we get today. Okay, um, the next step change was um, during the uh, International Geophysical Year in the late 50s, uh, 1957, 1958. This is when science was really sort of ramping up um, across the globe. Um, and this is a um, a uh, big uh, international effort to really start to sort of make some uh, push forward some uh, different branches of science and um, the Antarctic was no exception and many bases were established at this time. Mawson Station had actually already been established um, in 1954 but many other bases were established during this time. Um, McMurdo actually, sorry I was wrong before about uh, this is when McMurdo was established, I'm uh, sorry for that, uh, Bellingshausen, Berg, Casey, Davis, Stumont Deville, the French base, uh, many other bases as well, all established as part of this uh, in IGY effort. Um, there were multiple um, sort of small science expeditions. Uh, Cyple Dome um, was uh, starting to be developed, things like that. This is just, uh, and just to uh, put this into context in terms of other um, things that were going on at the time, this is also when. Uh, the Keeling curve um, was started in 1958. So this is um, one of the big measurements which is showing how much carbon dioxide is in um, the atmosphere and this was started at uh, Mauna Loa, Hawaii um, by Charles David Keeling um, who is a professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, the anniversary of, um, of the signing of the Antarctic Treaty which was the treaty between uh, the nations um, that um, decided to uh, move forward with international coordination in Antarctica. Um, so there's a theme throughout this talk as well of cakes celebration. Um, I think that's the first cake so far. You have to bear with me here. I can't see any of my notes because um, the zoom thing is over the top of it and all of you and your cameras are over my slides. So that's why I'm having a little bit of trouble actually even knowing what's on my slides. I don't know if there's a way to move you all. It would be nice. Okay, um, so IGY um, just continued what happened there um, in terms of McMurdo and exploration of the Ross Ice Shelf. Um, there was several traverses um, and the Ross Ice Shelf was, um, was reached um, from Bird Station um, going over to Little America. Um, there was various instruments that were taken along that traverse. Um, there was um, ice thickness using, radio, uh, using ground penetrating radar. Um, and some surface elevation as well from leveling. So this is actually Charlie Bentley here. Um, I, my point is not working, um, but over on the far left of this image is, is Charlie Bentley. He was involved in this IGY um, expedition. Okay, so this is around about this time, like right after IGY, um, is when various different um, groups started to come together. We'd already had um, the International Glaciological Society had already formed in the early in the 30s um, and the first journal of glaciology had come out um, about 10 years before IGY. Um, the Australian Antarctic Program had also uh, formed around about that time. NSF um, and NSF polar programs and then the British Antarctic Survey were all formed sort of straddling IPY, uh, sorry IGY. Um, SCAR um, and also COMMAT, which is the uh, Council of Managers of the National Antarctic Program. So this is all sort of getting people organized and getting the community organized and coordinating amongst all the different nations. 
Um, so moving to into the early 60s um, time frame, and just to show you what was happening um, over in East Antarctica, and this is um, again starting from uh, Mawson Station, which as I told you had been established. Um, and so what they did there um, in East Antarctica was set up um, a couple of fuel depots um, so that they could traverse over across into the uh, onto the Amory Ice Shelf. And this is a program that Bill Budd and Max Curry were involved in um, in the early um, 60s. They had dog teams, um, so this is Huskies we're talking about, that were taking uh, sledges across the ice and over um, the hills and onto the Amory Ice Shelf to make their survey. Um, the red lines um, show you the survey that was undertaken. Um, and this is essentially to find out, I mean, you've got to remember back then they didn't even know anything about the thickness, the structure, anything about how much I was at this area to really understand um, what, they, what, what even was the Amory Ice Shelf, which they'd mapped um, earlier. Um, so this is in the um, sort of early 60s timeframe. Over on the right, this is one of the first photographs of the surface melt streams on Emory Ice Shelf. Um, people talk about these a lot today about as if they're a new thing. They're not a new thing. They've been there the whole time we've been going to the Emory. Um, and this is a um, ubiquitous feature of this, um, this ice shelf in the summer as um, surface melt forms in the blue ice region um, and then moves downstream. Okay, so this is showing you um, a little bit later, um, about four or five years later, a group of people, this is the um, Bill Bird, Max Curry and Joe Jacker um, went down um, again and they repeated some of the survey lines, but they um, did a bit more um, in terms of surveying. They had um, theodolites and they were um, measuring uh, the velocity and the elevation of uh, the ice along a flow line. Um, and you can see here on the lines on the right, um, the measurements that were made at different places. Um, take a look at on the left, this was what the, um, the stakes looked like. They put these big poles in the ice shelf that were about three meters high. Um, and that, that this is where they knew where to go back to. And um, this is where they set up their stations. Um, but there's a reason why I want you to remember this photograph and um, you'll see that in a minute. Um, so they found, you know, the essential uh, things that we know now about the Amory Ice Shelf, how fast it's moving, how much, how thick the ice is, these kinds of things. But obviously these are very much spot measurements, just a few places where they can go because they're on the ground and this is a huge ice shelf. Um, so they, they got a little bit of an idea, but it was just, you know, um, limited by what they could do by traveling um, just on, on in situ. So moving uh, now into uh, halfway through the timeline into 1969, this is actually a key year, I guess, for me and my story because it's the year I was born. Um, so there you go, I've just aged myself. Um, and also it's the same year when the first um, all female and female led science expedition occurred um, in Antarctica. Um, and so here they are, um, uh, by the, uh, here by the South Pole. Um, and this is uh, six women that uh, really did sort of lay the, uh, the framework for women um, in Antarctica and doing, uh, doing field work there. Um, so this was quite uh, interesting to look for in the media. So I spent quite a bit of time actually trying to find media stories about this. Um, and I did find one and here it is. Um, and this is uh, November, 1969. I don't know, uh, anymore what um, exact publication this was, like the Milwaukee Daily News or something like that. Very, very hidden. It was really hidden. Okay, I've just been told my internet connection's unstable. Hopefully you guys can all still hear me. Um, okay, the reason why I suppose uh, this was so difficult to find any information about is, remember this is 1969, and something else really big happened in 1969. Men landed on the moon. So I guess everybody's attention was on that and the sort of first female expedition to Antarctica wasn't really registering. But um, anyway, so here we are moving on a little bit um, further, um, moving into the 70s. And this was a time when um, 
a very pivotal paper uh, came out, and this is uh, John Mercer, and he, in this is all the way back in 1978, he published a paper um, that in Nature that predicted that there might be a very weak point um, in, West, in the West Antarctic ice sheet and that there's a link between greenhouse warming, so uh, carbon dioxide greenhouse effect and the melting ice sheets in West Antarctica and that we, um, because West Antarctica is on bedrock largely lying below sea level, we actually could be in real trouble in terms of um, sea level coming um, off Antarctica um, as the ice sheet melts. Somebody needs to go on mute. Thanks. Um, so this was a real pivotal paper, and this was what we now call the Marine Ice Sheet Instability, or MISI. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, at the, uh, as we go on. Um, okay. Um, okay, so this, around about the same time, is also when early uh, field work was being done on Ross Ice Shelves. Um, and this was the RIGS survey. This is the uh, Ross Ice Shelf um, survey, which was led by Charlie Bentley um, and Bob Thomas and Doug McHale were also part of this, uh, this pivotal expedition. Um, they, these grids here that you see in the middle, these dots um, are seismic soundings um, where they got very accurately the, uh, the thickness of the ice, but also the thickness of the water column or the ocean underneath the ice shelf as well. Um, so this was a really key um, information to get the shape and structure of, of Ross Ice Shelf. Uh, this paper on the left here um, in Nature by Bob Thomas, um, Effects of Climate Warming on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. This is actually the first time um, that the concept of ice shelf buttressing um, was mentioned in the literature. Ice shelf buttressing is something which we talk about a lot now. It's the fact that the process by which ice shelves um, push back on the grounded ice, much like an architectural buttress, which is why they're called that. So these flying buttresses here um, on Bath Cathedral. Um, and you uh, basically get the idea that this uh, ice shelf is pushing back on the grounded ice and resisting uh, the grounded ice from, um, from moving to the ocean. And as you lose the resistive force, um, so you lose the buttressing, this is when more grounded ice will come into the, um, in, off the continent and uh, form sea level rise. So this is a concept that we're talking about now, but this is the first time that it's there in the literature. So this is the, the sort of early warning signs uh, that things might be changing in West Antarctica, these two papers, Mercer and then Bob Thomas. Um, so around about this time as well um, is when we um, had some airborne surveys. This is the Spry NSF. Uh, TU Delft Airborne Survey, um, and these are the ice streams A, B, C, D, and E, um, the Cypel Coast um, off Ross Ice Shelf. We now um, have named these ice streams um, because they weren't very imaginative names. Um, and so this was uh, really a key uh, step forward because we could actually now see the real thickness, but also layers and something about the structure um, inside those ice streams, um, which is very uh, useful for the modeling um, efforts. Okay, um, and then the other big thing that happened um, in the 70s was, of course, the launch of uh, Landsat. Now, Landsat is a, um, a satellite series which is still flying today. Um, the, the eighth Landsat is flying now, um, but this is a overlapping or a continuous monitoring um, using visible imagery, basically taking photographs, but from the vantage point, point of space. So once you get into space, you get a much bigger area that you can cover and because Antarctica is so vast this means that we're able to get pictures uh, very nicely which remember I talked about the boots on the ground the people trying to make measurements spot measurements this puts that all into context because you now have this uh, big um, satellite view um, of what um, of, of what the, uh, the the ice streams look like um, just a little bit now about modeling. I mentioned modeling a second ago, but just from, think about where we were in the 70s in terms of modeling. These are the kinds of computers that we had. I remember a computer like this when I first started working um, on Antarctica. Um, and yeah, if you think about the type of um, models that they were running at the time, uh, very difficult. Uh, the computing power just wasn't there. Joe Jacob, um, told me about time, the time when they used to, before this, when they used to use punch cards 
um, for modeling. Um, this is this is a totally different world to where we are now. These are the kinds of grids that they work with here on the uh, bottom left and, and bottom right, the accumulation and the bedrock shape. Um, very, very um, primitive picture of what the ice looked like because we just didn't know, we didn't have the information. Okay, so around about this time, um, I was, um, well, I was working with computers like this, actually, uh, with Chris Rapley. Um, and I was doing um, maths and physics at UCL, and I was sort of enjoying it, but um, it wasn't until I took a class with Chris, um, and I know he's listening today, and he's probably going to be very embarrassed that I even mentioned this, but he was teaching a class that suddenly kind of made science make sense to me. It was physics of the earth, and that was the thing I would study, but I guess I hadn't quite realized it until that point. So meeting Chris was a pivotal point um, in my whole sort of science career. He introduced me to Seymour Laxon. Seymour was a postdoc um, and we did a project together mapping icebergs um, in uh, the Weddell Sea, actually an uh, iceberg that carved off the Larsen ice shelf. Um, so very similar um, to the, the iceberg that carved just a couple of years ago from the same ice shelf um, and it tracked up through the wet LC and we managed to track it in satellite imagery, passive microwave imagery. So this was um, when I was at UCL and this is a picture of uh, Homebury St. Mary where Chris and Seymour um, were working. Um, and then over on the right, around about the same time, um, this is the first IPCC report that came out. Um, this is FR, FAR, the first assessment report. Uh, IPCC is an international um, consortium. Um, it's a consensus of what's happening with the climate um, and it was uh, kind of a pivotal um, document and it sat on my desk when I was doing my PhD and it became kind of the motivation and background for a lot of the work that many of us were doing at this time in the 90s. Um, around about the same time, um, this is when we got our first satellite mosaic. Um, this is AVHRR, um, and this is a USGS um, mosaic. And um, if you look very carefully, you can see the ice streams flowing off the continent and out towards the edges to the ice shelves. Um, and I remember Bob Finchadler telling me um, that this was a real aha moment in his career because this is when he could take a step back and look at the continent and see the ice streams flowing. Um, and it was like the whole thing kind of fell into place and he could he could really see how it all um, hung together, which was very difficult to do before because of just these piecemeal surveys that people had done on the ground. And over on the right is, um, is it on the front uh, page of EOS, which is the AGU uh, journal. Um, just a, a snapshot of that over the Cypal Coast ice streams. Okay, so we're gonna move forward now to uh, the, the sort of the final uh, 25 years, um, which, I guess is when the most discoveries were made in terms of science. But um, so this is a picture um, of me, actually. <laughs> that's me uh, on the Amory Ice Shelf. That's a uh, 19, well, okay, artistic license. It's actually round of, I started my PhD in before um, in um, Hobart, and Richard Coleman, Ian Allison, and Neil Young um, were um, my uh, supervisors. And okay, a bit of art, uh, artistic license here. It actually was 1995, but you know, a year, give or take. Um, and what we were doing there was um, we were on Amory Ice Shelf. I was on Amory Ice Shelf as part of a GPS um, survey to calibrate and validate alt radar altimetry because the ERS 1 altimetry. Uh, when I was back working with Chris Rapley, this is when uh, the satellite had just been launched. It had been up for a year or two by this point, and we knew that we had to uh, validate the measurements on, on the ground to know that the, the heights that they were uh, delivering were accurate. So that was why we had this GPS survey planned out on Amory Ice Shelf. So that's me on Amory Ice Shelf. And remember that stake um, in the other picture? So that is actually one of the same poles that I'm standing by, that pole. Um, that you see there um, is one of these poles from the Max Curry survey um, 25 or so years earlier, 26. Um, so that was kind of amazing. We actually found one that was very, very small as well because of the accumulation had 
um, built up so much that only a little bit of, was left sticking out. Um, so this is a survey that we uh, that we took uh, we undertook. Um, this is 120 kilometers of, uh, of uh, in length, six base stations, and we basically just drove on these skidoos. The um, and we did a kinematic GPS survey along that grid. And the lines that you see, the arrows, are the satellite ground tracks that we, we were validating. Um, so ERS-1 is a radar altimeter. Um, so this is where we were at this time. Um, and Jonathan Bamba, um, I uh, had met him. He was a postdoc actually with Seymour. So I knew Jonathan from um, MSSL. Jonathan Bamba um, published a, a digital elevation model of ERS-1, um, and this is it. Um, so this is our first digital, digital elevation model of the Antarctic continent from satellites. You'll notice there's a little bit of a, a discontinuity here um, around 82 degrees south. That's because the ERS um, altimeter only went that far south. Um, so there's a hole in the pole which is filled in by the spry data which I had mentioned um, earlier. Um, so this was the aha moment for me, I think, when I saw this. Um, this DEM, and then with this going on top, which is uh, and Warner put together, um, called the balanced velocity um, method. And basically, if you know the shape of the continent and you know the accumulation, you know how fast the ice has to flow for the ice to stay the same size. Um, and so this is what Roland did. And this is where, for me, um, the ice streams jumped out and I could really see it. Um, so this picture here um, on the left, which is, you see these sinewy rivers flowing out towards from the middle of the ice sheet out towards the edges. This is where you can really start to see the ice streams jumping out at you and um, the outlet glaciers sort of receiving all of the, all the mass flux. Um, okay, the other thing I meant, didn't mention on this plot was um, the top right here is an interferogram over, um, Rutford ice stream. And this was the first interfer interferogram um, over um, Antarctica. And it was uh, quite transformational because it showed that we could pick up very, very small signals of displacement, which was going to be used later to define the grounding line. And um, so this was also around about the time when I was starting my PhD. So with this, the, the digital elevation map, the validated altimetry, the models of mass flux, um, Ian Jochen also used um, SAR, um, but this is a speckle tracking type of SAR instead of interferometry. Um, and in this case, um, he was using it to get um, measurements of velocity um, tracking the ice packets as they flow along the surface of, of the ice. Um, so this is Amory Ice Shelf, which is over here in Roland's map and brought out here in, um, in Ian's map. And you can see that the speeds at which it's um, traveling at are very, very uh, large. Towards the front, it's something like a thousand meters per year. It's not the sort of speed that you would notice if you're standing there, but if you put a GPS there, you could tell it's moved after, after uh, you know, you, you can detect this in, um, in a GPS. Okay, so round about, um, or, or the, the next thing that we, that we did um, in terms of mapping was go more um, around the continent. And this is a map that Eric um, Rigno put together um, compiling uh, SAR um, tracking, so tracking um, the, the speckle tracking of SAR to get the velocities all around um, the continent. So this is all of the, um, the data that was available at the time. So you can see here, and it's a slightly different color scale, but um, that fast flowing is in pink or magenta and slow flowing is in green. Um, and the ice streams are um, very nicely depicted by this as well. And you can see we've nearly, we've got uh, pretty good coverage um, around Antarctica. Okay, um, so the survey that was taken in uh, by Max uh, Corey and Joe Jacka and Bill Budd in the late 60s uh, with the poles that I showed you is on the left here. Um, and on the right, um, the same, it looks like the same map, but it's actually different because now we have GPS um, on here as well. And this is some work that Matt King um, did, and he um, re-analyzed some of these um, GPS um, data that had been collected and compared them with the old uh, Max Curry data um, to get an idea of how the ice shelf had changed between the two times. So this is when I met uh, Matt, 
He was also in Hobart, um, part of our um, group um, it, at the at IASOS and uh, the School of Surveying uh, at University of Tasmania. Okay, so um, other work was being done in different places in Antarctica, and this is back to Seipel Coast. Um, velocity map again um, from SAR here on Seipel Coast, and other GPS work that was being done um, by Bob Bin Shadler and Sridhar Ananda Krishnan. And in this case, they had put uh, GPS out on the Willans ice plane, and they managed to detect a very interesting motion, uh, not just tidal motion, but also um, this interesting sticky behavior um, in response to changing tides. So this was sort of also happening around about the same time um, in the kind of uh, mid to um, late 90s. Um, okay, so this is a, um, now I'm going to just, oh, hang on. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, this is the ramp mosaic. This is um, not, instead of using, instead of speckle tracking to look at the velocities, just looking at the static amplitude image from the synthetic aperture radar, and then put them together all around the continent. You can see here that there's edges to this, um, straight edges, because this is multiple images that have been put together to make one mosaic. Uh, this is Ken Jezik's uh, ramp mosaic, the radar um, Antarctic mapping project. Um, so again, we have a very nice mosaic of the whole of Antarctica and how it looks um, from space, but in, this time it's in a different frequency rather than being visible. This is now um, in radar and so slightly different textures we can see here over the ice sheet and, and different things that we can pick out. Um, and then uh, Ted in, uh, Ted Scambos in um, 2003, he used MODIS um, visible to, um, to do, to also make a mosaic of Antarctica. This is actually called the mosaic, the modus mosaic of Antarctica, or MOA, as we all call it. Um, and this is 250 meter resolution, which was very high resolution and really great for putting um, other measurements in context when you plotted on top of these imagery. So you could really see where your uh, data were being collected um, on the continent. Um, okay, so Ted, also, um, around about this time, um, put together a sequence of incredible imagery, which showed us for the first time uh, the collapse of, um, well, for me, I remember this very, very, very clearly, this carving event it, or a disintegration event. It was, to get rid of my friends, anybody thought that this was um, going to happen. Uh, I think the time scale on which this happened was, was much shorter than anybody really thought. Um, so this is a Landsat image from 2002, um, and here we have the ice front, um, and this is 2000, this is just six weeks later, so this is January to March, and the whole ice, uh, Larsen B um, ice shelf has collapsed. Um, back to Amory, just uh, around about the same time, um, this ice shelf was not collapsing, and even on the bottom left here, it's not collapsing either. It's just carving um, an iceberg, which is quite a routine uh, thing for it to do. Um, but Jeremy um, was a student with me at Scripps at the time, and we collected some data, or he um, collected some data on the front of a rift, so we could learn about rifting processes, how the rift opens, the kind of seismic um, energy that you get as the rift opens. Um, very nice analysis showing um, about how rifting and carving linked together. So using different uh, geodetic or geophysical techniques to understand about the ice um, sheet processes. Um, meanwhile, um, we were ramping up, or people were ramping up for the, um, the follow-on to the IGY, which is now the IPY, the International Polar Year. Um, this actually happened over two years, so it was 2007-2008, um, straddled two Antarctic field seasons, and multiple projects happened during this time, and I would not do it justice to, to list them all because I'd forget people. Um, but for this one, I chose to highlight Robin Bell. Um, who is my dear colleague, um, collaborator, and president of AGU, and all these great things. Um, she's quarantining in a cabin, so I don't know whether she can listen to this. 
Um, but she um, had a project um, called AGAP, uh, the Gambas of Mountains, and um, many things were discovered during, um, during IPY, and this is just one of them. Um, this radar gram over underneath, um, over this area was, was really an exciting result. Um, Lima was a next uh, thing that came out for IPY, which was a little bit like MOA, but higher resolution because it was Landsat. Um, and so this is Bob Binshadler, um, Lima, Landsat image mosaic of Antarctica. Um, it's hard for you to see the change in resolution here because it's on the screen, it probably looks about the same, um, but very, very nice detail um, of features all around Antarctica from this mosaic. Okay, I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit, I think. Um, so I just wanted to um, go a little bit into some of the work that I did at this time. Um, and many of you know that um, I use altimetry and I've mentioned it before, and this is around about the time that, um, that ISAT was nearing the end of its mission. Um, the ISAT was a, a laser altimeter, NASA laser altimeter that was uh, operated from 2003 to 2008. Um, and we use it to detect changes in, um, in the ice sheet. And in particular, the work that uh, my group was doing was looking at changes in the ice shelf because the ice shelf moves up and down with the tides, as you can see from Laurie Padman's beautiful animation, which still holds today. Um, of the Ross ice shelf going up and down over the tidal cycle. Um, and if you sample at high tide and low tide and look at the difference, you can actually pull out where the grounding line is very nicely because um, you can see that tidal flexure just by differencing the profiles. So over here on the left, um, this is an INSAR interferogram to show you how um, sort of roughly, it's a schematic, where the um, the grounding line is in the INSAR, in the, in, in the interferogram, the SAR interferogram. Um, but in uh, ISAT, this is what we saw. So the profiles over, um, over the, uh, the grounded ice over here on the left, and then over on the ice shelf over here on the right. And the whole thing sort of comes apart when you difference them. Um, this is really nice. And we use this to map all around um, the edges of, um, of the ice shells to get a grounding line. Kelly Brunt uh, worked um, on this and this has turned into some really nice work. Um, but there was a bit of a distraction for a bit um, because one of the things that happened while we were mapping the grounding line was just that stream of the grounding line on Ross ice shelf. So um, the black line on the, on the left uh, plot is, um, is the grounding line and the red crosses and the shape that looks a bit like a ghost is Lake Engelhardt. And this was the first um, um, lake that was found using this technique. Um, and the profiles from it are over here on the top right. Um, and so you can see that there's a, a difference here of about 10 meters between the profile in 2003 and the profile in uh, 2006. And what's happened is the whole lake is drained by that amount over that time. And so what ISAT has done by difference in is found the um, how much drawdown of the lake there's been and therefore how much water has been transferred um, from the subglacial environment into the um, into the sub ice cavity um, and this was a really nice um, application of ISAT um, active subglacial lakes had been discovered just a little bit before um, using radar altimetry but this is the first time they'd be found on the ice streams um, and we knew about subglacial lakes already because of flying that had um, multiple airborne uh, radar surveys, including Spry and a lot of work that Martin Siegert had done uh, and Sasha Carter had done some work on this as well. Um, basically where you see a very flat, bright uh, target, you essentially put that down to it being subglacial water between the ice and the bedrock. Um, and so that's a, a lake. Um, and so these, this here is the map of lakes that was, um, had been found at that time. <clears throat> um, so the, over on the right is the map on, um, th that we had at that time. And over on the left is the new map from uh, the active lakes that we found with altimetry. So you can see here where the, where the colors are. These are the active lakes, um, which we found with, uh, with ISAT. And this is work that I did with Ben Smith of University of Washington. Um, and this is something like 124 lakes. 
So the two together, the static lakes from the radio, the radioactive sanding and the active lakes from ISAT two put together show all the lakes around Antarctica that we know about today. And there's been a few more discovered since, um, just because some of them fell between the ISAT tracks. So one of the things that had happened as a result of all of that work um, was we had initiated a, a collaboration with Slavek Tulicic, um, and this um, grew into a project called WIZARD, um, which is uh, Willans Ice Stream Subglacial Axis Research Drilling. And so one of these lakes, um, we were lucky enough to go and drill and put instruments in and get information um, about. Um, and so this was a really, really nice uh, joint project with multiple institutions. Um, and here's Slavic here. Um, I did not go um, in, in here, but Matt Siegfried um, was there and he told me this was incredible highlight of, of his work that he did as his PhD, uh, during his PhD. Um, and he, we, I was continually getting updates when this lake was being drilled into um, in, in 2013. Okay, so just taking a step back now, looking at the whole ice sheet um, and how we map it, different techniques. Um, we have, um, so remember, we're, we're, we're still sort of in 2007, 2008 time when I was going into this um, mapping lakes uh, business. Um, and there were other people who were looking at the grounded ice and trying to understand how much ice was there, how much was being lost, uh, what's the... Um, the, the long-term sort of mass change in the Antarctic ice sheet because that affects us all as um, the ice goes off the ice sheet and into the ocean and uh, causes sea level rise. So there were three different techniques that were being used for this. Um, so I'll just start over on the left for GRACE. So GRACE is a, a pair of satellites which measures gravity, um, laser altimetry um, and also radar altimetry. So NASA um, laser and ESA radar. Um, and then also SAR, so SAR was also on ERS. Um, so different techniques being used, um, coming all together. Um, different people getting different maps of radar altimetry. So Duncan Wingham, Jay Zwolle, Hamish Pritchard. And these are different maps. And the reason why these look different is because it's different time periods that are being looked at, but it's also slightly different instruments and slightly different areas over which they're averaging. So you're going to get a slightly different answer. Um, and so, the general pattern was similar um, and the overall signal was about the same, but at, the, at this time there wasn't complete consensus, especially when you started looking at the different techniques. So for altimetry, I just put Hamish there, and then Isabella Bellaconia, um, gravity, and then Eric Rigno for input output method um, using SAR and knowing the thickness, looking at the fluxes um, across uh, different flux gates. So comparing these three methods is a way to really understand how the ice sheet was changing um, on the grounded ice. Um, but the problem was at this time, 2007, 2008, round about IPY, was although these techniques were vaguely agreeing, they were more or less in the ballpark, um, and they, there was some discrepancy. They, they all agreed there was mass loss, but the exact sign of the change was not the same. So from this, um, there was a new study with, or a new um, international consortium that was put together called the Ice Mass Balance Intercomparison Exercise led by Andy Shepard at the University of Leeds. Um, and this um, is the first IMBI um, that went from the early 90s until um, 2012. And this is what Antarctica looks like in that time series. So you can see uh, dividing in the different regions, overall mass loss, um, but mainly coming from West Antarctica. You actually see it positive here because it's plotted as sea level contribution rather than mass loss. Okay, I need to jump a little bit. Um, so 2007, 2008, also the time of um, the IPCC that came out, which was the fourth um, assessment of the IPCC. And this came out basically saying, um, hey, glaciologists, you need to know what you're doing because we can't put the ice sheets in here because we don't know how they're going to change in the future and neither do you. This is a bit of a wake up call for glaciologists actually. And um, around about this time, right after this um, report came out, was when two different groups were put together, but they worked together internationally 
um, Sea Rise in the US led by Bob Binshadler and Ice to Sea in the UK led by David Vaughan of British Antarctic Survey. And these were consortiums of ice sheet modelers and people with observations that can help improve the models to really try and um, understand and improve our models so that we can, we can know what's going to happen in the future with um, sea level and uh, mass loss from Antarctica. Um, the plot here of the drainage basins shows you the potential sea level in all the basins of Antarctica. Um, East Antarctica is particularly alarming. There's a lot of mass contained um, in that part of the ice sheet. Um, West Antarctica adds up to about three meters or so of sea level um, equivalent. But the point is that we really didn't know what this um, signal was going to be and we couldn't predict it into the future and that was a problem. So this is a joint thing, NASA, NSF, NERC, everybody together trying to understand um, how things are going to change in the future. Um, okay, so uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about ice shelves again and what you can do with radar altimetry um, over ice shelves. Uh, Jenny Griggs and John Bamber had uh, created an ice draft map. Um, in, in other words, looking at the elevation of the ice, um, turning that into the thickness just for the ice shelves. So how thick are these ice shelves? Because if they're changing, we need to understand, we need to know how they started uh, at the beginning. Um, so we need to have a sort of benchmark to, um, with which to compare. Um, I used a very similar map to this, compared it with radio, radio echo sounding thicknesses um, to pull out the uh, distribution of marine ice under Amory Ice Shelf. This is part of my uh, PhD in Hobart. And from that, um, there was a drilling um, or a, a long-term um, Australian program called AMISOR, the Amory Ice Shelf um, and uh, Antarctic uh, Ice Shelf Ocean Research, I think it is, uh, sorry. Um, and this was a drilling, um, uh, several years of drilling and going in, exploring right through the ice shelf, but also exploring into the cavity and collecting measurements um, in there. So, okay, so back to ice shelf monitoring. I've been distracted for quite a long time on looking at lakes, as I uh, talked about a little bit before. Um, but one of the things that we really want to get back to was the ice shelves and how they're changing. So by this time, um, sort of in the early uh, like 2010 time period, uh, we had a long enough time series now that we could really start to look and see how the ice shelves are changing and what different mechanisms are, or forcings are acting on the ice shelves to make them change. Ice shelves change because of the atmosphere and the ocean, um, different time scales. So if you have a lot, if you have a long time period over which you are observing, then you can maybe get an idea of which of these processes are acting in different regions. Um, okay, so um, some work that I did with Hamish Pritchard looking at ISAT. Um, this is Hamish's paper from, um, from Nature 2012. Uh, the ISAT mission showed um, that the ice shelves are thinning um, over in West Antarctica. Hopefully my cursor will do that. Over here um, in the Amundsen Sea, where you see red, this is thinning. Um, the ocean temperature is also plotted. So you see that where the thinning is occurring is also where you have high temperatures. Um, so this is giving us a bit of a clue that what is causing the ice sheet to change or where the ice shelves to thin is the um, interaction there with the ocean. And this plot over on um, the left, um, a spillhouse plot, which I got from Mike Meredith, um, this is showing us and reminding us that Antarctica is so connected with the global ocean. Um, and that heat trans, the transport of heat um, un underneath or from the ocean underneath the ice shelves is really important. Um, and if that's changing, then that's going to thin those ice shelves. Um, Eric Rigno um, used, um, used a different technique to, and he um, actually partitioned the mass loss into uh, melting and carving, because we know these are the two mass loss processes for ice shelves. Um, and this was a very nice picture because it showed us where around the continent different processes were acting and which ones are dominant in which regions. Um, okay, I'm going to jump through a little bit because I'm, I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> Not that we've, we've all got time, I guess. Um, 
So um, one thing that we that we talked about um, when I showed you the Mercer plot was the marine ice sheet instability. And this is uh, the fact that the West Antarctic ice sheet is grounded below sea level. Um, and this bed map two, which is the shape of the seafloor underneath uh, the continent, um, shows that very nicely. These regions here um, are grounded below sea level and therefore a weak, a weak area. We call it a marine ice sheet. Um, so the combination of thinning ice shelves and, um, and grounded below sea level with a retrograde slope, um, and with, this means the marine ice sheet instability is possibly um, going to be a big, a, a big uh, thing in this area. But we hadn't really found it, we hadn't really seen it yet until this um, pair of studies came out in 2014, Eric Rigno on the left and Ian Jockin on the right. One was an observation study, one was a modeling study, but essentially pointing towards a very similar mechanism acting in this part of Antarctica. Uh, the marine ice sheet instability kicking in, the grounding line retreating, which is what Eric showed, and, um, and Ian showing um, the changes in, in water um, temperature. Okay, so. Um, Fernando Paolo, um, looked at the data over a slightly longer time period um, than Hamish because he had, um, had the advantage of using a longer uh, set of missions. We use radar altimetry for this, um, for this um, study. Radar altimetry from ESA going all the way to on Amory Ice Shelf. Um, and then there were subsequent missions, ERS-2, MBSAT, Cryosat. Stitch those all together and you get a long time series um, getting up to 25 years now of, uh, of change, actually close to 30 years. Um, and Fernando used that and uh, came up with a really nice uh, map of how the ice shelves are thinning all around Antarctica um, over this, at the time it was 18 years of change. Um, and essentially this is what's happening. Um, the ice shelves are thinning and um, what we thought is probably then going to happen is that um, we would see that in the grounded ice. If the ice shelves are thinning, you reduce that buttressing force or that restraining force back to the, uh, the grounded ice. And would you actually see that in, uh, in the grounded ice? Well, Hilmar, um, I don't have a photo of Hilmar. I'm sorry, Hilmar, um, <laughs> if you're watching. Um, Hilmar put Fernando's melt rates um, into a, uh, an ice sheet model and worked out that best in fact thinning we are seeing changes in ice velocity um, upstream and those patterns of ice velocity that were predicted by the model match very closely to what we see in the observation so this is a good um, clue that indeed uh, ice shelf thinning is causing changes in grounded ice um, in other words buttressing is really happening um, okay so a little bit more that we did with uh, Fernando's uh, study so Fernando um, took this one step further and actually analyzed the time series to kind of break down those driving forces and see if um, if we could he could distinguish uh, which were the dominant uh, forces and in this part um, of Antarctica the Pacific sector um, over um, on top of the long-term thinning trend there was also a signal of um, the El Nino or the Enso cycle um, and this was published in uh, 2018, um, which was very interesting because it's the first time that we really saw the signature of an El Nino of El Nino on the ice shelves themselves. Uh, so is um, uh, a student at Scripps now, my student at Scripps, and he is has looked at extending this time series, um, but turning it into basal melt rates. Um, so there's a manuscript which is uh, in uh, review at Nature Geoscience, which is looking at melt rates all around Antarctica from the altimetry. So, okay, the whole sort of big picture is we've got thinning ice shelves, we've got marine ice sheet instability, we've got places where the ice shelves are changing. Uh, it looks like it's the ocean that's doing it. So therefore we need to probably go and get some measurements in the ocean. This is, turns out this is a tricky thing to do. People do it, um, but, um, this is a very vast, treacherous piece of uh, coastline, as we talked about right at the beginning. Um, and it's a huge amount of area to go and make measurements. So how do we do this? Well, there's pretty innovative uh, ways that people are doing this. And I'll just show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a study uh, looking at the Ross Ice Shelf. 
um, where we put six Alamo floats, um, which are air launched floats um, with automatic uh, floats, and they um, were put along all across the front of the Ross Eye Shelf, uh, which is about the size of Texas or, or France. So this is a big ice shelf. Um, and so really six, six points isn't really enough, but um, it's better than nothing. And $1,000 um, an instrument, this was sort of uh, a bit of an experiment. Um, and we got some really nice information from, from that. So the British Antarctic Survey had Bodie McBoatface. Um, and this is another uh, very innovative way of collecting measurements, um, a, a AUV underneath uh, an ice shelf. Um, so we did this with our Alamos. Um, there's other different creative ways that people are collecting data. A lot of this is quite expensive. I just mentioned the price tag on the Alamos. Uh, it's, it's quite hard for, uh, to get money like this, federal money for this. So um, we, um, different scientists have teamed up with different uh, funding agencies or, um, or, or foundations. And this is an example of, of such a, um, a successful uh, example of that. This is uh, Knut Christiansen and uh, Pierre Dutru, and this is at University of Washington, and uh, Dots and I shall some really nice data here. Um, just another way of collecting information about the ocean for validating our satellite melt retrievals um, is using phase sensitive radar deployed on the ice shelf themselves. This way you can actually look at how the ice thickness is changing um, and you can use that to validate um, the satellite measurements. All right, I'm gonna bring us up to the present day and you're probably all glad because it's actually gone on a bit. Um, so present day, here we are, uh, 2019. This is a picture of Matt Siegfried, um, who was my former student. He's now an assistant professor at the um, Colorado School of Mines. And this is my student, uh, Philip Arndt on the left. Um, so Matt and Philip went to Antarctica in December. They were actually still there while I was giving this talk for the first time. Um, subglacial lake project that we had, uh, Salsa. So this is where we are in 2018. We have a very nice understanding of how much ice there is in Antarctica. This is the beautiful Rima mosaic um, from uh, which is the Polar Geospatial Center, which is a very high resolution imagery from Worldview, which is also uh, have, has height information in it from ISAT and Cryosat. Um, we also have had a decade's worth of uh, ice bridge, Operation Ice Bridge, um, and so this has been incredibly important for collecting information about uh, ice thickness and also ice elevation all around the continent and, um, and bathymetry information. So we really are in really good shape in terms of data sets. Um, this is the new bed machine that was launched in uh, December. This is Matthew Mollerheim um, and his new, um, this is going to be now input for models uh, for the future. Um, this is what the current sort of state of we have for um, Eric. This is continent wide now, um, similar to what I showed before, but now we have complete coverage. Um, so here we are. We've got the old map in the top left from the 1930s. We've got the bed map, a bed machine. We've got the ice velocities. We've got a really nice picture of the continent from Rima. We're in pretty good shape. Um, we've also got a very nice satellite that's been up for um, a year and a half now, ISAT-2, um, a new uh, next generation version of, of ISAT where the beam is split into three pairs. Um, and in this way, we can very nicely get the, um, the cross-track slope. Um, so very uh, high spatial resolution, um, very keen for people to start using this data. It's really um, lovely data. Um, encourage everybody to, to get their hands dirty with these data. Um, this is the ISAT2 science team here on the right with our lovely scarves um, from our team member, our team leader, Laurie Magruder. Um, happy first birthday. This is to continue the, the cake theme, this talk, which um, just a couple of uh, results, uh, nice results. The rifts um, very beautifully depicted um, with ISAT2, just to show you the resolution that ISAT2 is capable of here. Um, very nice structure here in the rifts on the rift walls and melange inside. And then over on the right, those Amory melt streams, which I showed you from the 1960s. Here they are again, um, and here they are in ISAT. So the green laser of ISAT 
um, can penetrate through water. So you get a, a signal return or photons from the surface of the water and then photons from the lake bed. So you, the difference between the two um, tells you about the thickness of that water column, uh, in other words, the water depth, which is really um, going to be transformational in terms of working out water volumes. So um, looking over the whole ice sheet, and here's Ben, our ice sheet to, uh, ice sat to uh, guru. Um, and this is a paper which I'm delighted to tell you all um, was just accepted yesterday into science. So it will be coming out at the end of April. Um, and this is an effort by the whole land ice team of the ISAT2 team, um, putting together, looking at Greenland and Antarctica, but this is just Antarctica, um, over the whole ice sheet, ice, grounded ice and the ice shelves, um, and looking to see where it's uh, changing. Um, and yeah, keep, keep an eye out for that coming out at the end of April. Okay, um, so MB2 has also just come out, and MB2 for um, Antarctica. So this is what I'd already showed you for MB. MB2 um, shows a scenario of increasing sea level rise, in other words, increasing mass loss, um, which is coupled with uh, separate information um, from a different set of satellites looking at sea level, um, showing that sea level, the rate of sea level rise is accelerating. Um, this is quite alarming. Um, we now know that the ice sheets are, um, everybody's eyes are on the ice sheets and it's become very relevant to society and uh, thinking about climate change and how the planet is changing. And this is a little bit about how um, the IPCC has evolved. This is the, in the 90s, where we are with the first report. Um, this is when we were told we didn't know what we were doing. And now we are at the stage where we have just had our own report a couple of years ago, the, the SROP, the Special Report on Ocean and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate. And we're also just starting to, uh, we, we've been doing models um, and models have been coming out in journals which will be going into the next IPCC. So this is ISMIP 6 for the AR6, the sixth report. So this is quite incredible when you think that we've moved from being told we don't know where we are to now we're actually running models, especially for an IPCC. Um, so back to Philip and Matt, why were they there finishing up Salsa and not me? Well, when I discovered the lakes, this is me back in 2007, um, I had a young family. Um, and so these, these girls are actually now no longer little kids, they're teenagers and we have Daisy now as well. So, I mean, it's kind of a big commitment to go to Antarctica when you have a family and um, I have decided to, uh, to not make that commitment. And um, I've been very lucky that I've had students um, and postdocs and other people who've been willing to run field programs for me. But that's not to say that all women have made that decision and there have been a lot of um, real leaders in terms of um, exploring um, Antarctica. Um, and here you see a, um, a, as many women as I could get on this figure without it just getting crazy. Um, I actually am on there too. <laughs> I was the first woman on the Amy I shelf apparently. Um, Kelly Faulkner, uh, Julie Palais, Robin Bell, the first women here. I, um, we have Christina Holbey, Ginny Catania, um, we have um, Jane Francis, and then uh, this is Jackie Ronnie, um, and the Ronnie Eye Shop is named after her. Okay, and this is uh, Ingrid Christensen, who was the first woman to see Antarctica in the 1930s. These uh, two. Okay, so with this um, in mind, I mean, um, the field is definitely changing. In the last couple of years, I've seen a big change in terms of people's attitudes. Um, there's a lot of now awareness of why it's so important to have such a diverse group, um, um, not just in terms of gender, but also in terms of race and different uh, people from different backgrounds studying uh, the ice sheet to bring all different uh, uh, knowledge and um, understanding to this. Um, so, yeah, this has become uh, definitely an issue many of us are aware of. Um, the other thing that we're all crucially aware of is how important our science has become to the public. Um, this is Maddie Rosevear here um, in the Observer uh, on Totten Glacier. Um, we, you know, we, we're always being watched. Um, our science is so interesting. We often have reporters calling us to find out what the latest thing is. I mean, it's very much um, on people's minds. Um, there's a lot we can do in terms of relaying our science. I think we've all seen in the last five weeks or however many weeks you've been in, in lockdown, 
um, that there's definitely um, a different way that science gets translated to the media. And um, I think it's very important to have rational, calm voices speaking to the policymakers and delivering the message as it needs to be delivered. So just here is an example of a few people who've done things like that. Um, Richard Alley has really been a pioneer in this stuff. He's here on the, on the, oops, on the right, um, bottom right. Uh, he's testified before Congress several times. He's a complete hero. Um, I'm going to put a plug in. He's giving a um, the next, he's giving a seminar tomorrow for the Polar Seminar at Scripps. If you want a link to that, we should be able to uh, hook you up. Um, Twyla Moon and Robin Bell uh, did a congressional hearing last year. Um, Sashil and Maya were at COP last year, and there's a photograph of them here with um, my director of Scripps, Margaret Leinen, our congressman Scott, Scott Peters, and um, here's to Shiel describing what a gigaton of ice looks like over New York. Um, and then in the middle is myself and uh, Ram um, talking to the San Diego City Council about sea level rise and then a sea level report that we did um, a couple of years ago. So this is a lot of uh, activity that many of us have been involved in. And I'm sure there's many more of you listening that have done things like this, but we need to keep going with this. Um, this was a session that we had at um, AGU right after I delivered this talk. Um, there's a link here that I've put up and I'm willing to, I'll send it to you, but it's uh, on the AGU YouTube channel. You can go back and hear all of these talks. Um, this is Jane Lepchenko, who basically said that we have a, um, it's sort of our, we're stewards of uh, the knowledge that we have as scientists. We need to get that information out there to the public. And it's our, it's, we're in a privileged position to study the earth and we need to sort of get that information out there. We have a responsibility. So this was a very pivotal session. Um, Chris Rapley um, was very instrumental in getting this going. Um, so I encourage you to listen to this. Um, planning for the future, uh, I mean, a lot of you might not know how much um, effort goes into planning missions and things. I was on a decadal survey, which was looking forward to the next 10 years. This was a lot of work and a lot of people in the room figuring this stuff out. So. A lot of groundwork. Um, it's also being used to prop up my laptop, so it's been very useful. Um, Thwaites Glacier, I think next week, Sridhar will talk about this. Um, so I'm not going to uh, belabor this here, but we realize that Thwaites is a big area that we need to focus on. It's thinning fast. Um, there's circumpolar deep water going underneath the ice shelf and melting it. Um, and there's a big uh, joint NSF NERC field program. Um, that's just completed its first field season and looking forward to Sridhar's talk next week um, all about that. Okay, so um, Operation Ice Bridge has just wrapped up in uh, this sort of broader or back to Hobart because they, the last season of Operation Ice Bridge was um, out of Hobart um, going into East Antarctica, which I think we're all realizing, um, well, many of us realized all along, but East Antarctica is very, very important in terms of um, future sea level rise from Antarctica. Um, and Hobart has that vital central location in terms of accessing East Antarctica. Um, so NASA and um, Australian Antarctic Division joined up for this. And here's a lovely cake that was made for that. Um, slightly somber note just to uh, talk about the, the heroes uh, who we've lost during this time. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's a, you, it's a closed community and it's very, um, you get to know people very well. And these are some of the people who we've um, said goodbye to over the years. So I'm going to leave you in the words of Mawson. Um, this is where the title of the talk came from. Uh, this is a hundred dollar note that he appeared on for a while in the nineties. Um, he's a bit of a hero um, in Australia um, and for good reason. Um, we came to probe the Antarctic mystery to reduce this land in terms of science, but there's always the indefinable, which holds aloof, yet which rivets our souls. So I'll leave you there. Just think about, though, we've observed for 100 years. Um, it's a long time for us as humans, but it's a really short time for an ice sheet. Ice sheets change on very, very long timescales, more like millennial timescales. So 100 years of understanding Antarctica and really only 50 years of observing it properly with geodetic measurements um, is not really enough to really understand truly how this great ice sheet is changing. Um, but despite all this, um, I think many of us will agree that we're pretty privileged to be working in Antarctica at this time. 
at this sort of golden age in terms of how much data we have, the satellite missions that we have going, all the discoveries that have been made. So I guess it's time to, well, the theme of AGU was celebrate and look forward. So celebrate our accomplishments. Um, so maybe have some champagne. I have a nice Antarctic glass. May not be able to see. Um, this is I sat to champagne, which I have sitting in my fridge ready. Um, contemplate. Um, just think a little bit about the future. How do we want our future to look? Do we want more remote meetings? Probably not a bad idea for a glaciological community to be thinking about these kinds of meetings more and more, reduce our carbon footprint. But also, what kind of instruments do we want up there observing? What projects do we want to be involved with and leading? Because uh, you need a lot of time to plan them. Um, communicate what we know to the media, um, get that out into the public, write your papers, all that kind of thing, um, but you know, make the message clear. And then, um, of course, collaborate. International collaboration is key. Antarctica is huge. We can't do this without many nations. It's not just going to be one person being a hero here. It's all about working collaboratively to understand this continent. And so the IGS seminar, global seminar, I hope we'll have many more examples of this. And um, that's it. Sorry, it went on over the hour. Um, good luck for the rest of your lockdown. And I guess I'll take questions if there's time. Hi, Helen. Yes, I was going to say, maybe we could have two or three questions uh, if people have them. If you type in the chat, I will find you and un um, mute you so you can talk. So if anyone has uh, a question, just write yes in the chat and we'll find you and able, allow you to uh, ask a question verbally. Um, just as a, as a starter maybe, were there any real interesting surprises when you looked at the new data from ISAT? Can you give us a teaser from the new paper that's coming out? Um, well, the first, I mean, the biggest surprise was the being able to see through water. I mean, that was really incredible. I think we all knew that it was going to be something that could be done, but until you actually see it, um, that was, that was, but also, um, this is not in the paper at all, but um, being able to see bathymetry, uh, actually measure bathymetry in places where um, you have um, calm water as well. Um, so in terms of the paper, it's a very, uh, it's looking at the whole ice sheet, the, um, the grounded ice and the ice shells, and it's also looking at Greenland as well. Um, but it's the first time that we've really looked at the whole ice sheet with the same instruments over the same time period. Usually we split up the grounded ice and the floating ice. So um, it's nice because you can make links between the mass loss from the ice shells and the grounded ice. So is, are there any questions from anyone? Um, it seems that everyone's uh, saying thank you very much. So uh, clearly- Philip there, uh, he can wave. Philip's. <laughs> <laughs> Just to advertise next week, uh, as Helen mentioned, uh, Shrida and Antakrishnan will be talking about results from Thwaites Glacier. So hopefully see uh, lots of you then. So. Thank you indeed, Helen. That was really wonderful. Thank you for starting so us much, off. Everyone, and, and uh, let's, let's hope that uh, we can continue uh, this series, maybe even after we move out of uh, lockdown situations. Um, so, hope to see you all next time. Thank you very much for, for coming along. Thanks. Goodbye, all. Stay safe. Stay well. <laughs>